Filmmaker Jonathan Demme is here for almost 30 years. He has successfully divided his career between Hollywood mainstream films and low-budget independent movies and documentaries. Here is just a brief look at an extraordinary career in film. My name's crazy, honey. What's yours? B Bernice. Two choices, Bernice. Do what we say starting now or say goodbye to the world. Uh, I'll take the first. I went around and I applied for a job at a uh, place like uh, McDonnell Douglas, uh, Northrop, Hughes. Well, what happened there? They didn't want me. What a shame. Oh, how come you keep saying that? What a shame. Well, I might have done something. Like what? Ah, it's always showtime here at the edge of the stage. And I, I, I wake up and wonder what was the place, what was the name. If I ever catch you two together, Keeping Tony on a leash, I think you'll find one in aisle five. What became of your lamb, Clarice? I killed him. You still wake up sometimes, don't you? You wake up in the dark and hear the screaming of the lambs. Yes. So let's just get it out in the open. Let's 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 get it out of the closet. Because this case is not just about AIDS, is it? So let's talk about what this case is really all about. The general public's hatred, our loathing, our fear of homosexuals. What might your name be? The... E... L... O... V... E... D... His latest film is called The Truth About Charlie. <laughs> it is a remake of the classic 1963 film Charade, which starred Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant. I am very pleased to welcome Jonathan Demme back to this table. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Charlie. It's, it's wonderful to, to be here. here. Uh, tell me about The Truth About Charlie. It, it's been, we just saw Beloved, four years since you made a feature film. You made a documentary that you and I talked about a lot, having yes. to do with Haiti. And, um, and that you were in, incidentally. I'm in because of an interview we did here on the show. Um, tell me about making this. Why would you want to make this? What is it about this story? What, why four years since you made a movie? Well, the four years um, since making the last movie has to do with a couple of false starts on a couple of things along the way. Yep. And then um, I got involved, um, de deeply involved in the writing process right. for this script, and, right. and that took a, a good, good year there. Um, you know, I saw Charade again um, about three years ago and was reminded of how much I love the picture. So and did it, I. It's just, it's, it's unique and, and extraordinary. And I also felt that, you know, it's, it's been, uh, the picture's about 40 years old now, and I thought that maybe, maybe it's past the statute of limitations, and if we were to, if, uh, if I was able to get permission to do a new version, and if we took the whole kind of, of uh, wonderful, mad spirit of charade and, and ourselves kind of went off in a, a crazy direction, that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe we could do something special. So um, I called Stanley Donan. Mm -hmm. and um, asked permission uh, to, to see how he felt about the possibility of a remake, and he, he gave his blessing, and, and um, we were off and running. Now, why did you change the title? That was one of, of I thought that, you know, the, the easiest way to, uh, to signal um, from the start that this is a, a hopefully a, a fresh new version of a great classic that, yeah. that's going to have life its own. Well, let's let's start off with a different title. Also, because um, you know, in 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 both of these movies, enormous amount of energy goes into finding missing money uh, on the part of the characters, and that's one thing. That's that's one mystery about 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 these pictures. Mm. You know, where's the money? But the the uh, I want people to think about who killed. Charlie, Tandy Newton's husband, right. and why did they kill him? Because there's a whole other very interesting dimension of, of the picture that, uh, that, that plays to that. Yeah. yeah. When people know you, I mean, just think about all the movies that we just saw, and they think about Philadelphia, or they think about Silence of the Lambs, or Cage Teat, or all the films, they always want to say, how can a man so gifted not want to do an original work? 
rather than even if it's a classic? And the answer to you is what? Charlie, I feel that our, our remake of Charade is highly original. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I really do. Um, uh, it's as simple as that. You know, it's, we've, we're very inspired by a great picture, and we took off in our own wacky direction. Right. And I think we've come up with a very, very original film that's based on a, a great uh, previously existing movie. You spent a lot of time on the script yourself. Yeah. It, it, was, uh, it was interesting because uh, due to the fact that we started off working with Peter Stone's screenplay in the first place right. for the original um, movie, right. um, I, I just had tons and tons of ideas about where I felt this should go. And um, I spent, uh, there was a moment when Paul Thomas Anderson was going to write the script, which I was yeah. very excited about. That would um, be too. Yeah. We're friends, I know. Yeah. He got the idea for Punch Drunk Love. So, yeah. <laughs> so I just decided I was going to dive in and, and, uh, and work on the script myself. And yeah. I teamed up with Steve Schmidt, and uh, we had a, a, a blast. All right, let's take a look at some scenes. This is where uh, Regina, played by uh, Thunder Newton, meets uh, Joshua, played by Mark Wahlberg, outside an air the airport in Paris. Here it is. I'm going to ask you something real quick and make it like ripping off a bandit, okay? Oh. Go ahead. There, Mr. Regina. Not for long. Your ride didn't show? Yeah. It's part of the course, I'm afraid. We need a hand? Yes. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, tell me about casting and, and how you, with the director's eye, uh, knowing the significance of casting, looked at these two. Well, Tandy Newton um, play was the title character in Beloved, right. and um, she is absolutely as gifted an actor as I've ever worked with. And uh, it was thrilling to see that young woman bring that character to life every day on the set. Yeah. And I realized um, as the shoot progressed that Tandy had, had uh, played thus far, up to Beloved, um, only sort of outsider parts. She played American Slave in four different movies. No one knew what her voice even sounded, much like yeah. what she was like as a the, the kind of fat fabulous, amazing, uh, terrific, contemporary young woman that she actually is. And I felt, here's a chance to take a great actress and kind of introduce her as, a, as the dazzling contemporary person that she yeah. is. So, You've got to know her in Beloved was the first time you yeah. worked with her. Yeah. yeah. And how about Mark Wahlberg? Now, Mark Wahlberg was uh, suggested um, early on by Universal Pictures. Um, mm -hmm. They were very excited about Mark. He was filming uh, Planet of the Apes at that point. And um, consistent with, with the need to much less the desire to move as much away from the Cary Grant approach uh, to the part <laughs> that's, as that's possible. Far, that's far um, away. Mark rang a bell because it, it's yeah. true. He's a very kind of street smart, boy next door, complicated, edgy, fascinating young man. Yeah. And I felt that we could um, really take a whole fresh approach and not try to duplicate um, the, the magic um, on any level that uh, Charade has with their two leads. I know it's a stupid question, but why have we there, everybody has wanted to, s I know a lot of actors who would like to be Cary Grant and have <laughs> fantasized about becoming Cary Grant, a whole range of them. And no one has occupied the place that he occupied in movies. Now, you could probably say the same thing about Bogart. You could probably say the same thing about Tracy mm -hmm. and others, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to take maybe even John Wayne. You know, mm -hmm. Maybe there's something sui generis about each of them. Uh, but he did have this sort of persona mm -hmm. and presence that was unique. Yeah, and it, it's, I wonder if, it, if uh, to some degree it has something to do with being a, a, a figure of a certain time, yeah. culturally as well. Um, uh, there was a wonderful innocence um, uh, that Cary Grant projected, I think, and certainly in, in uh, his comedies, um, that, that in the presence of the sophistication um, <laughs> that he was all about and being so debonair was really interesting. Um, you know, he's a, he was an amazing, one-of-a-kind actor, and I don't know if we have that kind, of, that kind of sophistication and combined with innocence available in this no, day I and age. No, I think that you captured it right there. You know, there's a great line about somebody once sent, sent a telegram to him and said, how old Cary Grant... <laughs> <laughs> and he sent back saying, oh, Cary Grant, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. It's, you know, a lot of people have said um, uh, to, to Mark, you know, well, who do you think you are stepping into Cary Grant's shoes? And, yeah, exactly. and Mark says, well, you know, I'm stepping into my own shoes. I'm playing this, this part uh, my way. And the thing about, about uh, uh, Mark is that if I was interested in, in uh, trying to 
to remake a picture with a great film star on the level of the people you were talking about and do what I think would be lunacy to try to duplicate mm -hmm. the, 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 the persona of that person, I would uh, put Mark in a Steve McQueen movie. Because yeah, I think exactly. Mark has a lot of qualities in common it seems with Steve to me McQueen. So. Me too, yeah. And, and which was what? You edgy, uh, street. Intense. Uh, loner. Yeah. Uh, intense. Uh, something that makes you want to want to care for him and yeah. and and, yeah. and vulnerable. Cuddle him up to yeah. yeah. Right. Very yeah. very 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 Edgy interesting and, mixture. Yeah. Take a, it's interesting how those are qualities. Do they come out of the performances they do, or are they come out of the persona they are, the people they are? I always think of it as a, as a 50 50 equation. Um, being a really gifted actor, having you know extraordinary ideas and the, and the ability to get into that moment and, and, and put that reality a, 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 a across in a really gripping way is one thing. And that's half the battle. I, I really feel that, that who you are as a person, what you bring to the party in terms of unavoidable, the this is yeah, meanness of right, really yeah. contributes a lot. And I think that, I think of like Tom Hanks uh, 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 yeah. is an incredibly terrific guy and I think yeah. we we sense that and he's also a fabulous actor but I think we, we love to spend time with with Tom and and Jodie Foster uh, has this huge courageous heart in addition to being this lovely woman and there's something very special about her as a person and I think that that translates uh, every bit as well as uh, as uh... we'll get to some of those in a minute I was thinking of Anthony Hopkins as you were talking uh, take a look at this this is where Commandant Dominique played mm -hmm. by Christine Bosson questions Joshua, who is Wahlberg, as we said, about his relationship with Regina. Here it is. I always wonder, with a woman like that, what kind of guy actually gets to go to bed with her? Well, in this case, a dead one, I guess. Pecco? Well, surely you're not suspicious of her, Commandant. No. Well, she just doesn't seem like the type. Which type is that? The murdering type? The story. The story. What is it about the story that interests you? What interested me most about the story was, it's my favorite one-liner. It's a, a terrific <laughs> woman surrounded by a bunch of, of untrustworthy, difficult men. Uh, and she's trying to do the right thing, and all these guys are making things really, really difficult for her. Um, I've always loved that. It's, you could call it a woman in jeopardy, but it's a, it's a little more complicated than that. But Science of the Lambs was that kind of story uh, on a certain level. Uh, Married to the Mob, another movie I did, kind oh, of I had that. that too, yeah. it's, you just get a, I, I just love the whole idea of, of, um, of uh, rooting for a, a terrific young woman. You and I had a number of conversations about Jean Dominique, mm -hmm. you know, and the Haitian journalist. What was that experience like for you? Well, um, the, the Jean's death, or yes. yeah, well, no, no, that first, but also right. the fact that you felt compelled to make a documentary. Well, the, it, it, the situation, uh, my relationship with Jean Dominique and making a film about him was very, very unique because when he went into exile um, with President Aristide in the early 90s, I had encountered him very briefly in Haiti and thought this was one of the most charismatic, amazing uh, individuals I'd ever come across. I sought him out and said, can I tape you? Can, can I tape you telling your life story? Um, having you tell the history of Haiti, having you say whatever you want to say. Um, and uh, uh, you're a journalist in exile, and then when um, the coup is toppled and you return to your microphone, we'll have a, a, a film about a journalist in exile with a happy ending, yeah. the journalist back at the mic. Right. And we shot these amazing sessions with Jean, and we became very good friends. Um, we went back, and the military destroyed his station, so we couldn't get the ending just then of him back on the air, and time went by and nothing happened with these tapes. When Jean was murdered on April 3rd, 2000, um, I realized that uh, you know I had this stuff, and I, I sort of had a, a, a commitment and a need to kind of prove that I wasn't kidding myself about making a film about the man. So I went down to Haiti um, and filmed the station going back on the air with his wife now lead at the microphone, the extraordinary Michelle Montas, and uh, we shot a bunch of stuff, and, and we're just finishing editing the movie, and we've showed it at a couple of film festivals as a work in progress, and have discovered that Jean really is the world-class guy, I always knew he was, yeah. that people... You, you can feel and see the power of the man. Yeah, and you, you are in this film twice, Charlie, once when you interviewed Jean during yeah. the coup, right. and then later when you reported on his death. Oh, good, I'm honored to be there. Uh, and so when will that be 
available? It'll be completed sometime over the next couple, three months, and yeah. we'll start hopefully showing it at film festivals. With documentaries, you never know what's going to okay, happen. But that's, I'm getting to that, too. D that diversion, because you started, because you were intrigued by an individual, and then the, the tragedy of the country and what happened to him and his own kill assassination, that led you to... D how, did, how did it make you feel about documentaries? I love documentaries, um, but I, I love them both as a as a consumer. Me too. Um, yeah. I love to to learn something that someone's had some passionate interest in, made a film about it. And now they're they're sharing uh, their feelings on this stuff. I just love them, uh, and I love to make them too. And there's always this funny dichotomy with uh, making documentaries on the one hand and, and fiction films on the other hand, because with um, fiction films you're trying to often trying to make them feel as real as possible. And with the documentaries, you're kind of trying to take the footage that you've got and dramatize them as yeah. much as possible. And for me, I think that the experience kind of helps fertilize my work in, in, in both those areas. Where do you put Silence of the Lambs among the films you've made? Um, well, as, as I'm, just, I'm the lucky duck who got to direct uh, the movie based on, on Thomas Harris's brilliant, brilliant novel and had the, the great good fortune of having that amazing cast, Jodie Foster, Anthony Hopkins, Ted Levine, who's also in Truth About Charlie. Um, it, it was, I just uh, was very, very lucky, Charlie, to be I've there. I've never understood why you didn't want to make Hannibal. Thomas you Harris. looked at the script. Um, uh, I read the book, right. and Thomas Harris um, took those characters in such a bold, different direction from what I had expected. I, I had been expecting something very formulaic. Um, I, I had my own idea of what Thomas Harris was going to write, and I was ready to do that. Yeah. And when I saw this very dark, startling vision of, of where Clarice went and how she fi figured into Dr. Lecter's life, the I thought... The obsession she had b beyond just catching a criminal. Well, just that, yeah, just it was, it was, um, uh, uh, I, it was just a journey. I, I, I called Tom up and I said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of heartbroken after reading this amazing new book of yours because I've, I've, we've, we've lost Clarice. And, and I felt that, uh, that because of this loss of Clarice that uh, I just, it was a journey I couldn't take. And, and Tom um, said, uh, uh, not lost for good necessarily, Jonathan. Don't think of his loss, but rather away. <laughs> so, Lord knows what. Where he's, he's going to go. You bet. Uh, okay, but let me ask, what was it that he did with her that you didn't like? Um, in Hannibal. You know, gosh, I, I, there were things, and it wasn't that I didn't like so much that, that really upset me, you know, as a, as a, cause you gotta realize that, that I'm, I'm sort of in love with Clarice Starling. Yeah, that's nice. And I <laughs> even have a, a rather strange friendship with, with, uh, Dr. Lecter. Yeah. Um, but, um, I just, I hated seeing Clarice so fallen from grace. Um, and so, so outside, you know, with all the aspirations and, uh, yeah. that, that we saw in her as a trainee and a recruit at the FBI, to see that she had, within that bureaucracy, fallen so low. And yeah, but I thought that she was unfairly victimized by that, I thought, weren't she? Well, certainly, but, mm -hmm. but and again, you know, it, just, it, it made me sad. It yeah. made me sad, and, and um, I didn't feel I was the right guy to, to take that so, trip. But, but the you know what the conventional wisdom is? It was too violent, you didn't like the violence. Uh, That's the conventional wisdom, not that you somehow, what happened to Clarice left you sad. No, I, I, gosh, I wasn't offended on any level by, by Thomas Harris's book, Hannibal, at all. Yeah, um, so the violence, just, it, it, did you like the choices at the end? I mean, you know, what happened at the end? Um, I, I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't you? <laughs> I, I was. I think Thomas Harris shocked himself. <laughs> you did? Well, did they, they actually changed the ending from the book. Um, I haven't seen the picture. Um, oh, come on, John. Yeah. Why haven't you seen the picture? Um, well, did, uh, go ahead, tell me. I mean, Maybe it has a little bit to do with, with at the moment. I've, I haven't seen Red Dragon yet either. And, you know, the day will come when I'll see these movies. But, you know, I, <laughs> I, I live in my own little Clarice, Dr. Do. Lecter dream you world. I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> well, I mean, so you'll choose at some point. You'll sit down and watch it. Oh, sure. Inevitably. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, it's, you know, it's fascinating and really interesting to me to see what has become of... of uh, of uh, the ongoing sagas yeah. and the revisiting of the early days and what have you. Yeah. As good as Julianne Moore is. And she's know, great and she's in great. everything. God, this was they're, they're just that relationship. It's, uh, it's I feel like great, it's, it's, it, it's, you know, it's one of the greatest sort of pairings of conflict between two characters in movies. Well, I agree. And I, 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 again, I just can't tell you how lucky I feel to have been yeah. there when it all unfolded. You know what the name of her first son is? Charlie. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and it has nothing to do with, with 
with any Charlie I know. But right. I, I think she just likes the name. Uh, it, but who doesn't? Yeah. Exactly. By well, the way, I, you know, in, yeah. in, in our movie, the truth about Charlie, yeah. uh, we've got Charles Aznavour yes. um, singing a song, and we show a clip of an early Charles Aznavour movie, the yeah. the brilliant Truffaut picture, shoot the piano player, where his yeah. character was called. Charlie. Yeah. So Charlie's all over this thing. Oh, God, I can't <laughs> wait. All right, I can't wait. So I have not seen his movies, Jonathan knows, simply because of time, and I look forward to seeing it. He is uh, someone that I admire enormously for reasons that he knows, and someone who has brought really special, a special sensitivity to the craft of making movies. Uh, Jonathan Demme, thank you, my friend. Thank you, Charlie. Great to have you here. Thanks a million. Again, The Truth About Charlie, it opens nationwide on October 25th. And it's very funny. And it's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> like its director. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.